Good morning, everybody. Daniel Spatz, the first live interview, live from uh, 2022, this new year. Happy New Year, everybody. Um, I'm here in California, like I normally do. Brad, good morning, joining very quickly. Okay, so I was trying to connect. So I'm ready, ready to go. I'm gonna give the welcome to Brad Gilbert and everybody, good morning, uh, happy new year. My best wishes for everyone. Let me send Mr. Gilbert. Brad, the invitation was sent. Okay. Hey, good morning. Good, good morning, uh, you got me here? Oh, hold on. Yes, sir. it's a little bit dark. Uh, we couldn't i was on the computer couldn't couldn't get it on the computer so i don't use this platform so i'm not really oh perfect but the, no no i can see you and hear you very well the only thing is dark okay. too dark in your room i mean right now let's see now i can see you better my friend okay hey buddy how are you happy new year yeah good morning how are you Thank you, Brad. Thank you very much for uh, accepting the invitation. It's an honor having you. This is amazing. I can't believe it. Yeah, pleasure. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Thank you, everybody. People from all over the world, Brad, and he's saying hi. Brad, I, I mean, you, I heard that you said if you talk about tennis, it's a good day for you, right? You know, one of my favorite things to do now at 60 years old, uh, 6.30, maybe when it's just starting to get light, I go over to Pepperdine, the lower courts, and I hit on the wall. I, you know, I like to hit two, three days a week on the wall, 20, 30 minutes. And it's something I've done my whole life. And anytime I get a chance, whether or not it's to talk tennis, hit a few balls, you know, I've been doing it my whole life and, you know, I love doing it. Okay, uh, thank you everybody for, for uh, India, Brad. I will, you have people watching you from India, wow. So, Everywhere. So, Brad, uh, I'm going to surprise you. Uh, I, I watched an interview that Mary Carrillo did in eight, 1989 before you play uh, John McEnroe in the finals in Dallas in WCT tournament. And you, you said, uh, I don't know how, how I win, but I, I'm very steady. I don't make mistakes. I don't make too many winners little errors and i i bring out the worst from my opponents i frustrate them i love that what do you do you remember that i mean that was amazing i mean i have i had hair and, and listen dallas is about to have a <laughs> tournament coming up in february and it's going to be the first time dallas is going to have a tournament since that last year they played the wct finals in 89 john thumped me that day it, you know it was best of five set you know tournament every every match um i don't remember that but i remember losing you know it's funny the older you get you forget wins you remember losses he beat me in straight sets on a really fast quick court and we started at like i don't know 11 in the morning the final but i don't remember much of it but i remember losing yeah but but i i saw your records i study your matchups head to head with the big ones and uh, and one player i mean uh, Lendl, right, was the one that you beat everybody, Brad. You beat all the big names back then. But what, what was it like to play with against uh, Ivan? Uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, but why? What like, happened? Like, because you were... like the first six or seven times that I played him, he just was too good. He kicked my ass. I mean, he was just so strong. And I was getting decent, but he was already great young. The last four or five times that I played him, I felt like I was finally making progress. The last time I played him, 1990 Philly, I was up 4-1 in the third. And somehow in the second set of the match, I knew I hurt my foot. I, I did something to it. Um, end up not winning that match, losing 7-5 in the third, missed an easy volley on top of the net to take a 5-2 lead. I was sitting in the training room after the match with a big bag of ice on. And he said to me, he goes, if I had 110 temperature and I was on my deathbed, I wouldn't lose to you. And I never got to play him again. I was so bummed. You know, I was ready to say nobody beats me 16 times in a row, but he toughed me out. He was just, he was a hell of a player, let me tell you. 
Brad, uh, you with Andrew Agassi, you have an amazing record, 4-4, four, four, for all, for each. Um, I got him a few times when he was young. You know, you know what's funny is the older I get, the better I used to be. You know, I snuck a few wins against him. Um, I think it probably helped me coach him a lot because I understood him his game a lot. Um, but it's funny, it's like I forget now. Like, I, I, I forget, like, Jesus, I played these guys a long time. Yeah, but... I mean, we had a couple of tight matches. A couple of times he crushed me, um, but I like playing. Wow! Yeah, and 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 you know, it, it wasn't interesting because uh, you beat everybody, and uh, and 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 it's amazing, amazing. But let me ask you this: um, if you would have to write rewrite the book, another winning ugly, whatever, or whatever name you wanna you wanna put on it, with similar chapters, which chapter? Mr. Brad Gilbert will add based on the changes of the game. Well, it's amazing um, 30 years on that winning ugly is still like relevant. And people talk about winning ugly in politics and all sorts of other sports. Um, and I, anything that you do, whether or not you played, you write this long, you could always say, oh, I, I wish I could have done this and I wish I could have done that. But you can't. And we did it just to help club players, to help juniors, you know, learn how to understand their game a lot better. Because a lot of people at that point took tennis lessons on learning how to hit the ball. They didn't, you know, they don't really give you lessons on how to compete. And that's what so much of tennis is. But the massive difference between tennis now and then, it's just played, oh my God, the 500 ranked guy in the world now is so much better. I mean, from the equipment to the speed to the athleticism, you know, but that's the same in every sport. You know, we mm. things keep moving forward. Who'd ever thought after Andre and Pete so quickly, we would have Rafa, Fed, Joker. The level just keeps going up, in my opinion. I, and if I could go back, ask God, tell him, give me a better serve. Great, Brad. Uh Would you make any change in the game of tennis? You know, I talk about the rules because I heard people say only one serve, uh, uh, deciding points, not at points anymore, like uh, we, we see in doubles or not. Um, you, you know, I mean, a, a couple rules, you, you know, listen, we could have simple rule changes. One, one rule that I would change, you know, especially on the pro level, you're not allowed to catch your toss. You throw it up, you got to hit it. And... I probably would play let serves and I'd actually be okay. You know, like in a best of five set match, I, I'm definitely don't want to see us give up the best of five in slams, but I, I could definitely see like we do in doubles to going to no ad scoring. It makes it a little bit faster and makes some, you know, a lot more drama in the short games. Um, but I like tennis the way it is. I think it's a great, beautiful sport, got great athletes, but I mean, some simple rules. I like the rule now that we, you know, we just did at the open of the electronic line calling system. So who who thought we'd ever have that? So I like forward change. Brad, um, we hear about that the new generation um, is struggle with tactics, with with uh, uh, being thoughtful on the court. And you are an expert in that. Are you agree with that? I mean, they said they hit hard, just hard. You, you know what? everybody has their own game, their own individuality and their ability to problem solve. Some do it obviously better than others. Look at what the big three have done the last 17, 18 years. It's, it's crazy, but it's their ability. I think the greatest thing, you know, that like a lot of times that what's the one common thing the big three can do is they can problem solve in matches. They can figure out how to win when they're not anywhere near a hundred percent. So many players can win when they're at 100%. And when they're at 50%, they can't win any matches. So that it's strategizing. It's figuring out how to win when you're not firing, how to win those matches and turn them around. And more than anything now, it's how you keep it, you know, evolving and improving your game. Fantastic. Uh, Brad, um... If you if you coach a player now, right? You coach three big uh, names: Erotic, Agassi, Murray, and other, many others as well. But uh, 
Go to do something different. Uh, I'm, as a coach, uh, when you're training, if you have to train it, uh, one of the new guys, would you do something different in the training sessions that you've done before with those big names? The, the great thing about tennis and whoever you're coaching, once you start coaching a player, in my mind, I say it's like a blank piece of canvas. It's day one. Whatever's happened before doesn't matter. What matters now is what we can do moving forward to work on your game, to maximize your game. So that's always the, the goal, I think, as a coach, is not to compare your player to somebody else and not to make him a player that he's not. It's to make his game be better. That's, that's the goal. You know, and sometimes it's just, you know, a different voice. Sometimes it's the little things you can say. Sometimes it's the nuances in strategy. There's always different factors. But believe me, just because it works for one player doesn't mean you can coach the same for another player. So that, I think that's one of the things that, that is my best quality as a coach. I'm able to look through the player's eyes and try to figure out what we can do for he or she to make them a better player. So clear, Brad. Um, which players in the last thirty years after the book has been released? If you if you if you go take those thirty years uh, about, uh, have been representing or still representing the winning agri philosophy? You would say, Daniel, this guy knows how to win it. You know, agri. Um, you actually believe it or not, there's quite a few guys now that aren't playing like that slam the serve, slam the first ball. Somebody like a Medvedev, he's got a very eclectic game. He's a big guy and he runs everything down. Her catch, another guy, big guy, big serve, runs everything down, massages a lot of balls. Actually, Zverev, big serve and massages the ball around, big backhand, but Andy Murray. So, you know, their games aren't like a Federer. Their games are a little more about maneuvering the ball around the court and using their legs. So there are, you know, listen, there's still room and there will always be room for different types of players. Not everybody can play like a Fed. You know, it, listen, it would be so easy to play like him and, 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 and have a record like him, but there are very few. It's like once in a generation. You know, somebody like a Rafa, hard to emulate a game like that, but it works brilliantly for him. But I think that there's still the potential for all types of players. You know, obviously, if you could have two weapons, the two most important weapons to have are a serve and a forehand and movement. Those weapons will still manifest itself. Brad, I want to hear your definition of talent. Because talent and, and tennis is related with hands in general. We say, oh, she's very talented. He's very talented. For Brad Gilbert, what is the definition of talent? It's a good question. It, it, it's hard to put, you, you know, an explanation on it. But I'll say um, for the greatest players in different sports, I'll tell you the one quality that's maybe underestimated, it's the ability for, let's say, tennis at the highest stakes, whether or not it's a basketball for Jordan or, or Wayne Gretzky or uh, some great Olympian. It's for things to slow down at the highest point and they become clear in their thinking what they need to do tactically. So they're all of a sudden, when it's five all in the fifth, they're thinking clearly. They're thinking clearly what they need to do, opposed to like making any rash decisions. And Tom Brady at 44, look at how well he's still playing. Mm. It's amazing. But I think it's the ability to slow down and process when others things speed up. Fantastic. When you walk through tennis courts, Brad, and which uh, kid boy or girl is really attracting you to you stop and you say wow i love the way she or he plays i think now probably you know when you look you know i don't look for one specific thing you know but i do think the biggest change that you need to be great especially on the men's side 
speed kills. It's really difficult after seeing Rafa, Joker, and Fed, how you're going to be – and now look at a guy like Medvedev covers the court. So I think there's different ways to play this game, but I think movement starting with kids is paramount. So when you see a kid with good technique and good feet, you know what I say? You know, and, and when you see somebody, maybe the technique or the footwork, you know, isn't great, then, then you worry about it a little bit. But I do, I look at technique a little bit, but footwork now is so incredibly important. And, you know, if you can have the ability to defend and play offense, you, you know, I don't think you can be an amazing player at the highest level if you can't defend, you know. So you have to be able to defend and you have to be able to play offense. You can't just play offense. You can't just play defense. You got to be able to embrace defense and have offense. Have you ever coached a female player, Brad? Professional female oh, player? Oh, yeah, I have. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, I worked with Martina Hingis a bit uh, for a little time in 96. I worked with Mary Pierce. I worked with Tatiana Golovan. And I like to think now at 60 years young, whether or not I work with a, a boy, a girl, you know, a pro guy, pro uh, lady, I don't think of them, you know, as a guy. I think of them as a tennis player. And how am I going to help them become a better player? So moving forward, let's say if I coach a pro again, whether or not it's a guy or a girl, it's a lot more about what we can do to make you a better player. How can we make you improve and get your results better? Brad, you played in the, to me, the best time in tennis. It's my opinion, of course. Uh, the same in the 80s, the 90s. Uh, is the, le the game less tactical now, Brad, compared with the 90s, the Edbergs, the Sampras, the Gilberts, the Connors, the McEnroe's, or not? You, you know, the one thing I like to think about is I live in modern times. The set was, so we played then, but now we're playing in 2022. And we're put, the game is still beautiful. Uh, I actually, I'm one of the older guys. I like the game on grass 50 times more. I, I didn't like the game, you know, 40 years ago when it was the ball bounced like this high and it was a specialized surface. The clay used to be slower. Now the clay is quicker. It has, you, you know, quicker balls. The grass is slower. We get 15 ball rallies on grass. I think it's beautiful. So maybe we don't get the variety as much from serving volleyers. But I also thought when two guys like when Goran and Krejcik and Beck, some of the guys that had bomb serves, bomb serve versus bomb server on a quick court, no rally going longer than three shots. That's tough for the fans to watch. But now maybe some of the rallies are too long. It's always hard to get the balance right. But I live in modern times, what we're doing now, and I love seeing the skills. But I think the skills have gone up incredibly because of the defending ability and the movement and also the, the strings now, the Luxalon strings have allowed the players to take bigger swings and, and be able to keep the ball in play. Talking about strings, I want to know, I'm wondering, the, the, which weight of the racket you, you use, Brad, and the strings and the tension? I'd love to hear about that. Um, well, you know, when I played, obviously back in our day, I played with a bigger grip, much heavier racket. Um, now I, pl I play with a Wilson. I play with an older Fed stick. Um, and I play with an 1820 string pattern. Very difficult to get that. Well, I, I think I got eight-year-old sticks that Wilson still, you know, I like the 1820. I play half gut, half Luxalon, but, um, and, and, it's, and it's lighter than when I played. But I'm not like a crazy tinkerer, you know, <laughs> like when I played. I'm happy with the sticks Wilson sent me, but I do like 1820, uh, the tighter swing, uh, string pattern, half gut, half Luxalon. And I have a tennis shop. I've had a tennis shop in Marin County for like 17 years. So, you know, I love, you know, my colleague, Darren Cahill, is way more into tinkering with rackets and strings. Listen, I got a stick I like. I go hit with it. The, the, the racket don't miss. I freaking miss. And that is a good message for, for the juniors and adults, Brad. Brad, uh, as an Argentinian, American, South American, 
I would love to hear about South American tennis. What is your, tell me the most talented players that you've ever seen from South America, Brad. And, and why, right? You like this? Most okay, it's a good question. I, I mean, the most talented uh, South American players. Um, you know who was probably, you know, God, the first time I saw him, I was like amazed. I thought he was going to like have another five to seven more years and winning slams because he bombed the ball was Jose Louis Clerk. And he stopped at a really young age. Um, so I didn't see Vilas as much. I, I knew of him. I actually played him probably his worst loss of his life, losing to me on clay. Um, Gomez obviously was a great player. Um, maybe the best clay court player that I ever saw from South America was Guga Querton. Um, but I think that there's no doubt that Delpo would have been the best South American player ever had he not got hurt after winning the U.S. Open the first time, comes back, gets hurt. He's had so many injuries. I think if he had never got hurt, he'd have won at least five to seven slams. So I think he would have been the, 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 in, in the open era. On the, the men's side, um, I, Maria Bueno was way before me, but you know had way more slams. But on the men's side, I, I think Delpo would have been the most prolific had he not gotten these injuries. Two names, Brad. Uh, Marcelo Rios, David Albandia. What do you, what do you, you saw them, of course, and you, you made, you, you watched them and, and you were making comments, right? And ESPN, yeah. remember? Yeah. Rios is probably the most talented guy I've ever seen for 5'8". I mean, he was not a very big guy, but when he was on court, you didn't realize he was small. He had the ability to take the ball early. He had a great serve for size returns. I mean, he got to one in the world for a second. You know, when he won Indian Wells, he won Miami, um, got to the finals Australia, but wasn't able to probably sustain it as long as you thought. Incredibly talented ball striker. Nobanian is one of those guys that was good on any surface. Uh, you know, a really good ball striker. Um, not not as much of um, injury problems as Delpo, but he had his share of injuries. Um, listen, he was a smidget from winning the Open. When I was coaching Roddick uh, in 2003, he was up two sets to none, and Andy squeaked out a third set tiebreaker, and then Nelbandian ran out of gas. I mean, I think it, Nelbandian beaten Roddick that day he'd have beaten Ferrero in the final. Heck of a player, um, both incredibly talented, but completely different types of players. You know, one was more of a ball striker and Nomanian. Um, Rios had incredible feel and, mm. and the ability to take the ball early. Very, could do some special things, but just wasn't able to probably go to the levels that you thought maybe he was capable of. Brad, what is your biggest, now moving you to the, your TV work and ESPN, how many years have you been in, in the air? I've been working for ESPN since 2003, and uh, it's been a great pleasure to call, you know, tons of matches, get to sit courtside. Sometimes I got to pinch myself, you know, courtside when I'm sitting there for watching the big three and watching some of these great matches, because at heart, I love tennis. I'm a tennis fan, and... I get to do something I love. I've got to play, I got to coach, I get to commentate. So basically I get to have fun, you know, with tennis. So it's, it's a great honor. And what is your main goal that you want to focus every time you talk to the audience, Brad? What do Brad Gilbert tries to transmit to, to, to the audience listening to you? I'd like to think of that, you know, at 60 years young. And who'd ever think we were in this crazy pandemic two years on that's not slowing up. We're in, you know, serious times. Look, you got to always have a mask on now. And look, it could be going on another three to five years. Stay healthy. You know, mm. live a good lifestyle. Don't take tennis for granted. I love tennis. Every time I'm on the tennis court, it's a good day. It's a good, you know, something that I've been able to do my whole life and be passionate about something. But, you know, be careful now, you know, 
We're mm-hmm. living in extraordinary times and, and be careful, uh, get vaccinated, mask up and go to the tennis courts. Every time you go to the tennis courts, doesn't matter if you're a junior, you're a club player. And remember, I think sometimes it gets lost for so many juniors. This game is fun. It's something that you can do for the rest of your life. Don't make it so stressful. Don't make it, you know, like it's, you know, end all be all. Remember, it's fun and love what you're doing. Whatever you do, I think that's the most important thing. Love what you're doing. Brad, and what is your biggest challenge as a TV commentator that you face every time you're sitting and talking to the audience about the matches, the, what is going on, interviewing the players you do before the big matches? I love to do that after the matches. What, what do you feel for you? It's a personal thing, right? The biggest challenge that you face every time? You know what? Every time a match happens, you don't know what's going to happen. And, and you're reacting what's happened. I think, I like to think a lot of people think that, I, listen, I don't overflate myself. They're the, I'm the kind of guy that drinks a beer. People think, oh, he, he might be calling a match. You know, he looks like he's, you know, like one of us. And I'd like to think of, I'm, you know, I got to pinch myself. I get to call and be part of a great match. Sometimes you wish that the match would be better. You know, sometimes you don't get a great match and you, you always, I always root for, let's have a, a good match. Let's have a seven, six in the third. Let's have a close one. But that's the beauty of tennis. You don't, you know, you watch it unfold and you watch what happens. You react to what's happening. Like you, you ask me a question, I react to it. Fantastic. And I hope you're having a good time, Brad. Already 30 minutes already. Uh, it's fine. Uh, Brad, uh, talking about USA tennis, um, I see players, junior players and parents obsessed with the UTR. Uh, instead of being obsessed with getting better, improving, and like you said, having fun, UTR, UTR. What, do you, what is your point of opinion about the UTR? Uh, it is a more it is a more accurate system for like okay, because it gives you results a month in advance and and if you lose a tight match it gives you I don't know all the intricacies because you know I don't play but I know all the college coaches and a lot of them use it you know for their rating system and it's a way of you know his rating in Belgium to know it here and stuff like that so I, and I think it's good for club players to say, if I'm a seven UTR, I'm traveling, I'm looking for a seven, eight to find to play if you don't know something. So it does have some really good things. But tennis is all about way too many junior players. Coaches tell every single player they're going to be great. Everyone mm. thinks they're going to win slams and be great. You know how few players win slams and are great and are number one. But everybody thinks they're going to be. It's not that easy. You know, I think more than anything, instead of thinking about being number one in the world, think about, just think about getting better. Maybe being a pro one day, maybe playing in college. Compete, have fun. But everybody's told they're going to be great. And listen, it's not that easy. If it was, everybody would be great. Brad, what is your take about tennis academies versus private coaching when building players? Uh, listen, There's no perfect way, but there's no better way. Uh, let me tell you, like 50, some, 50 years ago, I went to this public park called Davy Tennis Stadium. But let me tell you, when you'd rock up on Monday and I was 10 years old, I'd get games with older people. There was a lot of former players. I could always get a good game. And anytime you're around, so even if you're not getting any coaching, it, like, Andre will tell you the greatest thing about going to the uh, ING Academy, Nick Bollettieri's when he was 13. It's like he was better than anybody in Vegas already when he was 13. Next thing you know, there's umpteen people to play or if you, you, you know, there's pros to play. So I do think there's benefit to an academy. There's benefit to private coaching. Some players will thrive in academy. Some players will get lost. Some players don't want to be trained by one person. Some players will, will thrive on it. I do think competing is important, learning to compete, but there's no perfect way. I, I, I can't tell you. But for me personally, there's nothing better. When I was a kid, I'd rock up at this park. I would play a few guys. 
I would have a running Wednesday match. Maybe we play for three months and I'm up 18 sets to 14 on you. I'm down 14 sets to 12. We played for some, that's how life was then. You know, it wasn't about, you know, go, going to, you know, the internet and getting things. But I, in my day, literally you warmed up a couple minutes, you're playing a set. So that's what life was about. And, it, and so I do think that's important, but listen, if you, if there's an academy in your town and there's lots of opportunity to play with good players, it can only help you. And the last question about the USA tennis, Brad, I'm living here since 1996. And um, uh, of course, when I came to the States, we have Agassiz, Sampras, Chang, Courier, Washington, Martin, then Andy Roddick, your player, uh, James Blake. Uh, what is going on? What happened? Uh, 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 because you see, you no, know, the new, the, you, always we have good players. The girls, right? The, the women, you say Dennis did well. The Williams, Stevens, still. But what happened to the, the guys, Brad? What is your point, of, uh, your opinion about it? You, you know, we could talk about this for a week, but let's just <laughs> say this. Well, let's start with it's been th since 2003 US Open, we've had an American men winner. We've got a lot of good young guys now. You know, Fritz was getting better, Opelka. But I really like these young guys, Brooksby, Nakajima, and Korda. So let's hope that one of these guys can break through. But when I turn pro, I, I think like in 81, 82, maybe by 80, I'm going to say 82, I think I finished 50 in the world. I was the 22nd ranked American, you know. But there's no birthright that says this because we're American. We're supposed to have all the great players. Remember the Aussies? Look at all the great Swedes there were. There's no great Swedes anymore. They had so many. And who'd ever think a country like Switzerland would have a Federer? You know? So it's, it's become much more of a global game. And a player can come from anywhere. Um, so hopefully, like with these young players, it takes usually one or two good players And then maybe the rest of them can help be in the group, can be, you know, the last big group with Roddick, Blake, you know, Fish, Janipri, you know. So I think now with Korda, Brooksby, Nakajima, then we also got the, the, the group of 24-year-olds with uh, Paul, Tiafo, uh, Fritz, you know, Opelka. So it, they come in waves. Usually doesn't come in one for America. So if one of these guys can come through to win a major, I think we'll help the whole group. I think we're doing better than we've done the last five years. But like I said, there's no pa stamp on the passport that says we deserve to have it. Every country, Italy, they now have two really good players in Berrettini and Sinner. But they haven't won a slam since Panada in 77. How much do you think they want to have a slam winner? So France hasn't had a a slam winner since Noah in 83. So it's not so easy. Exactly. Brad, going back to the big three that you coached, uh, even though it's, it's interesting because they were all different. Agassi, Roddy, Mary, the style, right? I mean, uh, but what, would, what the, do they share in common? What would you say traits? They made them so great, Brad. Well, I mean, me as the coach, When I'm coaching Andre, then when I'm coaching Roddick, I have to work on Andy Roddick. It's not, don't compare him. Don't think about, geez, I want him to do this, what Andre did. Or the same when I go from Roddick to Murray. I, I want, you know, listen, would be great if I could take Andy Roddick's serve and put it on, you know, Murray or vice versa. You know, geez, I could take Andre's return and put, don't work like that. You as the coach, you're working with the player, and then that's it. You're trying to help him work or, or she work on their game, fulfill their dreams. And that's as a coach. Some may need more help with strategy. Maybe it's technical. Maybe it's footwork. Maybe some days you have to be the brother, the father. There's different things that you need to do as a coach. So it, it strictly applies to the player that you're working with at that moment. And that's what I think about. And I always hear that you said the best time to talk about tactics the next match is the dinner, getting the dinner with a beer and having dinner, right? Yeah, 100%. But some players aren't as relaxed. Just, be, you know, some players more, some, you know, right before. So everything is about finding out that little thing that makes your player 
what you know makes him tick what makes him be better what what isn't working you know and there's a lot of different nuances so there's no perfect you know resume or recipe for it so that's you know you got to be careful and figure that out few more questions Brad and I let you go I'm very happy okay. very thankful having you uh, take us through the champion's mind I mean what, how a champion think Brad because you played against so many champions and you were to me a champion number four in the world so uh, how, how a champions think how do they think Brad and, and once again it's not like a generic thing people think oh every chip everybody a, Rafa is a 20 time Grand Slam winner and He's as great of a player as I've ever seen, especially on clay. But he talks about, you, you know, it's no guarantee I'm going to win. Everyone thinks I'm going to win. And he, he, he's like, he's very, you know, he doesn't like, oh, you're going to win this, you're going to win. No, he doesn't take anything for granted. It's about competing hard. It's about working hard, doing the right things and trying to get better. And, and not thinking that you're too good or, you know, so everyone is different. But, you know, some are more confident. Some aren't as confident. Perfect. And how much time we should work on strength versus weaknesses in practice, Brad? What, what is your take about it? You, you know what? Uh, you should never neglect your strength. If anything, you should work on your strength more than anything. But... You don't want to forget your weaknesses, but one thing you don't want to do is obsess over your weakness. M many players obsess and then they focus on your weakness and then maybe the, your strength, you know, doesn't get better. So always focus on your strength and don't neglect your weakness. But if I had one shot to work on, I'd work on my best shot. And I have to ask you, I love... To it's a pleasure it's a luxury okay. listening to you All right, I've got I've got to do some uh, a couple other interviews this morning so last question boss okay uh, tell me about uh, any advice uh, Brad for juniors adults and coaches uh, from Brad Gilbert I, I say it you know all the time passion do it and be it because you love it and that's what you want to do tennis doesn't owe you anything you owe it to tennis to be passionate spread the love of tennis and you'll be better for it fantastic brad thank you very much ciao and, have, and have a great morning thank you brad take care and i see you i hope i see you soon bye everybody bye. thank you so much bye bye take care